Hey there. Hey, hey, how are you? Meeting me here at this time. Apologize. I was on, you know, the phone with my insurance and trying to not get it to be discontinued. And that took forever. So I apologize for that. I know it's the uh, open enrollment and all that stuff, right? So, uh, yeah, I like that. Ah. But, um, yeah, what's new on your end? Um, just kind of uh, running through the um, the content review, um, and this time, uh. I had I have the questions down of the ones that you know I want to I want to uh, go through the the, the Jack Weston um, yeah um, yeah the Jack Weston um, uh, Cubic yeah yeah the content diagnostic right exactly yeah yeah um, so desktop. And um, yeah. is it you know is it is it possible next time to uh, what are your thoughts on going through like um, the section bank like kind of raw and like going over strategy is that something you've done before or you do like uh, like a few questions to the section bank yeah yeah I go over section bank all the time um, but uh, I think before that. we want to make sure that we have all this content stuff down. So I would, you know, once we complete reviewing the content diagnostic, we could then use the section made. Okay. Okay. Got it. Cause it's like, you know, if you do the section bank without knowing the content, then it's almost like wasting it because you are using it. And, you know, and uh, if you don't know, certain things then you know you, I, I don't want you to get things wrong because you didn't know it I want you like if anything it, you get wrong it should be because of like <laughs> it should be for something you know strategy wise or critical thinking wise or something like that okay so okay. Mm -hmm. um okay um so i guess number 67 um i've actually never heard of the jacob ronald model um i'm sure it's probably in my on my my anki deck but uh, my anki deck lately i've just been focusing on the psych soch um but i mean the name of it is less I mean, like when I first saw it, I was like, "What is that?" Also, but, uh, but it's really something that you you probably know. It's operons. Do you remember that stuff? Um, yeah, when I think operons, I think about like bacteria and like prokary prokaryotics, uh, prokaryotic. Yep, and uh, um, let me tell me more about it. Um, like I think about lac operon and, um. But I, it's kind of it's kind of um, been a bit like I, I'm a little bit rusty in the details. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's what's one of the major differences between eukaryote and prokaryote when it comes to you know like the central dogma like RNA being translated into proteins or mm -hmm. Rather, DNA, you know, gets transcribed into RNA, which then gets transcribed into or translated into protein. So, what can you tell me about that in the context of like eukaryotes compared to prokaryotes? Uh, I mean, I, I guess eukaryotes. It's cut. It's more like like uh, it's separated, like transcription and translation. Versus prokaryotes, it's, it's happening simultaneously. The process, yep, very good. Because uh, there's no like separation between the two. Um, there's like a, a, a literal separation in in eukaryotes. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, 
now that's one of the differences um it does do any other ones come to mind um uh The, is it like the RNA versus DNA? Um, so actually, let me back up a bit. So um, you said that, you know, for eukaryotes, it's it's separate. Um, for prokaryotes, it's not. Um, what could be like, a, you know, like a reason for why it's like that? Um, does that have to do with like... Um, evolution and stuff and like how the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells formed like So what do uh what do eukaryotes have that prokaryotes don't have? Uh like membrane bound organelles and yep. like yeah. Can you give examples of those? Uh like mitochondria, um like uh Golgi apparatus. All right. Uh, Peroxisomes. Yep. Anything else? Um, what do you call it? Uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah. Yeah. Anything? Uh, uh, so what is like the most like apparent one? Like, uh, meaning like what's the... Oh, uh, oh nu nucleolus or like, uh, like a nucleus? Nucleus, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in a eukaryote, so so the thing is that DNA cannot leave the nucleus. It's like I use like an analogy with like you know like the Library of Congress or you know like where we have like our original manuscripts of things like original documents. Um, you can go there, but you can't take any of that stuff out like any of those books or whatever out. But what you can do is you can transcribe it by taking your own notes and you can take those notes home. So this analogy has the nucleus as the Library of Congress and it has the original manuscripts, aka the original DNA, but the DNA cannot leave the nucleus. It's like, it's too important, you know? So, so therefore it must be separate, right? You you have to separate the transcription, which happens in the nucleus from the translation that happens outside of the nucleus, right? And prokaryotes don't have nuclei. So there's no compartmentalization there. It can transcribe and translate at the same time now the uh the other big thing is that in eukaryotes a single gene will code for a single protein meaning like you know M mrna can't have like any given mrna that codes for protein cannot code for more than one protein. So that's called So it's it's not de it's not degenerate or uh yeah. think about like the the code of like you know all the different codon combinations and uh -huh. that's the degenerate thing, but this one is just so monocystronic. You've probably heard that term before. Okay. So um the um uh, this this means that like the there's going to be only a single gene that produces a single product whereas for prokaryotes polycystronic yes so a single RNA like strand could involve the genetic code for more than one protein. And so that's what an operon is because an operon involves, so like, you know, 
it'll be there'll be like a regulator gene, a promoter gene. I'll, I'll say like R for regulator, B for promoter, O for operator. But then we can have, so like for your example, you could have LAC Z. You could have LAC Y and LAC A. So if this operon gets turned on, it will produce or, you know, translate this uh, polycystronic RNA to make the protein lack Z, the protein lack Y, the protein lack A, meaning it makes, it can make more than one uh, protein. So, yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, so, okay. And so the operon, like if it, the, okay. So, and so the definition of an operon is essentially just like, uh, does, does it, it's like this entire thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so it's like a, you could think of it as a unit of genetic material that, um, that uses an operator, a promoter, but ultimately is going to be poly, a polycystronic mRNA uh, RNA that can therefore be translated into multiple proteins. I, I thought it was I thought it was monocystronic, no? Or uh, if it can make multiple proteins, that would be poly, right? Oh, okay. So wh where did monocystronic come from again? Sorry, the oh, so that's just us basically, like eukaryotes. Oh, uh, okay. So for us, you know, the mRNA codes for a protein and then gets translated into that protein, but it's one mRNA, you know, one gene per mRNA. You can't have multiple genes in an RNA molecule that's in eukaryotes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we get we get genetic diversity there's diversity through like um meiosis right with with the crossing over and that kind of stuff sister chromatids and recombination yep. is that how, okay okay mm -hmm. got it got it okay okay uh genetics i i tend to struggle with um this one here um i'm assuming that on test a might help to make a Punnett square, or I, I don't know what the approach is for this kind of thing. Or... Let's see. So, okay. So dihybrid crosses can be really annoying. Maybe like on test day, I would, on I, and I don't say this often, but I would, well, actually two things, um, or rather there are three things. So the first thing is if it's a little bit too complicated like this, it probably is best to guess, flag, move on, and come back to later. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, if you have the time, you can do the dihybrid cross, and I can kind of show you like a, sort of like a shortcut for it. And then the third thing is, if you just memorize the phenotype, phenotypic ratio for a dihybrid cross, that can help you get your answer too. So, so okay. So, the regular phenotypic ratio for, uh, for a cross between two parents that are heterozygous would be nine three three one. But let's see what we can do here because, yeah, dihybrid crosses would result in, like what a sixteen. Like a Punnett square is four. If you have like another one, you know, and, and they're they're multiplicative, so you know it's gonna be like it's if you had to write the entire dihybrid cross Punnett squares, it's gonna be sixteen total, which is a lot. So what you could do is something like this. So we have big B, little b, big T, little t. And crossed with the same thing, essentially. So 
what I would do is I would just draw a Punnett square for the B's and then a separate one for the for the T's. Now, okay, so let's see. So B, this over here gives us this. And then this gives us Okay, so they're both one to two to one separately. So um so basically the like if you now can kind of look at the combination. So like for instance, if we start with big B and big B. Let's look at the there's three combinations of the T's, right? It could be big T, big T. It could be big T, little T. It could be little T, little T, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like I'm distributing the big B, big B across the big T, big T here, the big T, little T, and then, you know, little, little T, little T. Okay, okay. Yep, and I could do it the other way around. I could have this be, you know, big T, big T. And then big B. Well, I, I guess I already did the big B. Big B for the uh, big T, big T. But I can then do that. And that, basically. But... Um, but yeah, so ultimately the, you're going to have something like, so, okay. So we can agree that I'm going to use red here. So we can agree that the one combination could be where they're both big. Another combination where it's like that, another one where it's like this, and then we can do the same thing for um, the other ones over here. But but I think the, the I guess, shortest way of, um, of doing something like this is just by knowing the, that phenotypic um, ratio. Okay. Uh, yeah, because uh, you'll get your dominant one. Yeah. Where are my annotate one? Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, I lost the annotate tool. So let's see. Um okay. I'm gonna make this even more simple. So basically, let's so okay. Let we could have big B, big B, big T, big T. We could have big B, big B, um, little T, little T. We could have little B, little B, um, big T, big T. And then we could have little b, little b, little t, little t. And so these are just the different, I mean, uh, these aren't all of them. Like, of course, you know, there's going to be also like uh, something like, you know, big b, little b, and then the different variations of that. But in terms of the phenotype, like the phenotype is just like, you know, what you see, uh, we can then say that like nine out of the total 16 will be this one, like big B, big B, big T, big T. Three of the, three of them would be this where it's dominant and recessive. So here, I'll do it like this. So this is dominant 
crossed with dominant. This one is dominant crossed with recessive. Um, this is recessive crossed with dominant. And then this is recessive crossed with recessive. And there's, for the dominant, you're going to see, and this will uh, always be the case, the nine represents the dominant dominant. The three here represents this dominant recessive, where the first thing, in this case, B is, is the dominant one, and then the you know second thing is uh, recessive. And then this three is the flip side of that, where it's the B is recessive and the T is dominant. And then the last one is just when they're both recessive. Okay. So I would say to uh, yeah, to like remember that ratio and what the nine represents, what's the what the three represents, et cetera. Because usually they'll ask you like, yeah, because they'll ask you about questions that are dihybrid crosses with typically the people that you're crossing are heterozygous. So that's what you'll get in your phenotypic ratio. Got it. So, okay, now the thing is with this question is that they didn't tell us that any of this stuff is dominant, but if it was dominant, that means that big B, big B is still going to be like big B, little b. If it's dominant and you're heterozygous, you're going to express that um, phenotype. Mm -hmm. That's why here in the solution, they, they wrote big T dash, big uh, T, sorry, big B dash, big T dash, meaning that we don't care what's in the dashes. They could be little b, they could be little t, but that won't, won't turn it into... It'll, it'll still be dominant because you only need one, but they would have to tell you that. So I think this question is a little weird because it doesn't really tell us, but, but yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. So memorize that. And then I, I the, the, uh, I've never seen C before, but I've seen A and B, um, from doing next long ago, but okay. Okay. 70. Okay. Um, I'm not too familiar with incomplete penetrance, which is funny. Isn't it? Okay. Yeah, this is kind of, it's been a while since I've seen this. Oh, yeah. So what do you think the different uh, things are? Like, um, okay, like, yeah, what's penetrance? Um, maybe how, like, frequently, uh, like, of penetrance, I guess, like, the expression of the phenotype, maybe? Yeah, it's like, how likely would a person who... has some type of thing um like let's say it's a disease or something like how likely is it that that person will express that trait right right so if it's so if it's incomplete penetrance Oh yeah, so I mean, so far yeah, I'm just talking about oh sorry the terms because like because okay so penetrance is like yeah it's a measure of how likely a person is gonna actually express the phenotype and then um, expressivity is uh something that would. Um, I think something uh, like you'll have the different 
gradations of something. So let me find, find a good. Okay. So open this picture and share it. All right. So penetrance, right, is all about in a given population, the like how likely is it that certain people will express a certain trait? And so we see that for variable penetrance, you only get, it's one or it's all or nothing. Because you can only get something that's purple, right? Or like purple or like white. And let's say white means, you know, they don't have it, the gene. So you see how it's all or nothing, right? <laughs> now for expressivity, that or variable expressivity, it's about how much of that thing, not whether it's it's expressed or not, but how much of it is expressed. And that's why you can see like, maybe like this, like more light, or or maybe this one over here is, is lighter. Mm -hmm. It's not expressing as much compared to like, you know, one that's purple. All right. Got it. So now there's also um incomplete um dominance. What would uh that mean um i'm guessing like if something's like homozygous dominant like ho homozygous dominant um i mean sometimes it's dominant and sometimes it's not like so incomplete so like for instance uh Incomplete, so like if you have like a red flower and, you know, and, and uh, you have a pink flower and neither of the alleles are dominant, you're going to end up with like a mix of uh, or a blending of that color. So maybe like a pink flower. Um, and that's different from... Codominance, right? Because codominance is when both traits are dominant and both of them appear. So you can see that in like some the the fur of some animals, like you know, or like a cow. Like if you look, think about a regular cow, it's like white with black spots. So that's an example of codominance because you have the dominant white color that shows itself and you have the dominant black color that shows itself so that's co-dominance just think of it that way co meaning that they're both dominant whereas if you have like a red flower and a white flower and you mix them and they give you a pink flower it shows that they're not they're not being just one or the other from the parent, but they're a mix of the two because they are co-dominant. Uh, okay. Okay. So, I, I'm sorry. Incomplete uh, dominant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. Now, for these choices here, Incomplete penetrance. So we said that penetrance is, you know, whether certain individuals get 
that have the genotype get or exhibit the phenotype or not. Um, B says incomplete dominance, individuals with the same genotype all exhibit the expect expected phenotype, but with varying intensity. That would be like, and uh, that's describing variable expressivity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that doesn't fit with incomplete dominance. Um, if they said variable, you know, expressivity, then that would work. But since they're saying incomplete dominance, that won't work. All right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then C says variable expressivity, which we know is just, you know, uh, varying intensity. But what it says is the inheritance of two different alleles produces an intermediate or mixed phenotype. That would be your uh, incomplete dominance then. All right. So I yeah. know you just flip them like this would be here. This would be there. Mm -hmm. And also in the solutions, let's take a look at that. So they have, let's see, for B, incomplete. So incomplete dominance is when inheritance of two different alleles makes an intermediate or mixed phenotype. So for that, just think of red flower, white flower, and then they get a pink flower, right? So, and B does not, you know, match up with what they describe it as. Then C, variable expressivity, describes a situation in which individuals with the same genotype all exhibit the expected phenotype, but with varying intensity. And you see how that's literally this. Exactly like word for word, mm -hmm. right? So, so really, what we could do here is, I mean, you know, if you change this into variable expressivity, and if you change this into incomplete dominance, then all of the above would work. Okay, but since they're flipping them, that's why it won't work. Good, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. It's a lot of genetics today. Um, yeah, not my. <laughs> is it, it? I shouldn't pay attention to like. You know the double AMC, their outline, they have it like percentage wise, like from this subject and that, like maybe 10% OCHEM or 10% FIDIX. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I shouldn't pay attention to that, right? It's just you have all your students just. Tell me yeah. more about what you said. Oh, what's that? Tell me more about what you said. Like, like I, sh I shouldn't pay attention to like, you know, how double AMC has like the percentage breakdown of like it has maybe, uh, obviously, it has a lot of biochem. And then I don't know how much genetics it has or, or physics or OCHEM, but it's really, you just have your students just kind of know everything essentially, right? So in the study schedule that I made for you, I mean, I didn't mention it at the time, but I made, uh, uh, so I took the AMC content outline and I turned it into a tab, you know, in the spell. Oh. And you could use that to see if some like whether something is fair game on the MCAT or not. It'll be the top. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Okay. Got it. Content, BB content, right? So on the BB content one, I just typed in, you know, genetics, and I get like four hits. So you get like, you know, all of that stuff. You can also see stuff like ribozymes and stuff so 
You could also see Operon Concept, Jake, uh, Jacob, yeah, Jacob Minad Bottle. So that, you know, is fair game for the test. Uh, but yes, there will be a fair, fairly large amount of genetics tested on this exam. So you can even see underneath it, like co uh, complete dominance, co-dominance, incomplete dominance, leakage, which I don't even know, penetrance, also expressivity. So sometimes it's like cut off, so you might have to make the the cell. Yeah, see this yeah. where I was. So before this, it was like this. Oh, okay. And you can't see the word expressivity, so sometimes you need to just make that you know wider or or longer or whatever taller. So, but yeah, and then meiosis they go into the single you know all these types. There's a so there's a ton of genetic stuff here. Meiosis, right? And then Hardy Weinberg and gene mapping, biometry, right? All of this stuff. There's a lot of it. So definitely. Yeah. So you could use that to check, you know, to see if this is something that they'll ask you or that's fair game for them to ask you. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you have a, it's like a three color system. So like green, yellow, red kind of thing or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I left it as a default at week, which, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done, but yeah, you can, you can, yeah, you can use this as reference, basically. Okay, perfect. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sweet. Um. Okay, yeah. So this one, um, let's see. Okay, how did you approach this? I um, I just uh, thought about the formula. Um, I I kind of knew um, the actually I didn't recall the formula. The p squared plus two two pq equals or or the hard the the p squared plus two pq plus q squared. I just thought that p plus q equals one, so I just so the p represents what? Um, I honestly forgot. But... So that represents the frequency of a dominant allele in a certain population. So, and then the Q represents the frequency of the recessive allele in a population. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's just talking about alleles. Now, you know, for diploid organisms like us, we require two alleles, right? So what do we do here? Well, you could do a, what's known as a bind. I mean, you don't have to know this part, but I think it'll help it make, make it clear instead of just telling you to memorize a formula. But if you squared both sides, you would get P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared is equal to one. Do you see how I just squared it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because up here, they told us the allele frequencies, but we are diploid. So what about the genotype? Genotypes, right? So if you have two, let's just say like, like, okay, big A, big A would be like P, like, so let me do this. Um, P is equal to, let's say, big A. Q is equal to little a. So that represents, you know, the frequency in the population that have the, the, the big A and the one that has the little a. Now, P squared is going to be A squared, which is really just 
A A. Right. <laughs> um, Q squared would. What do you think that would be? Oh, uh, little a, little a. And Q P Q. Um, heterozygous, so big A, little a. Good. So, all right, there you go. So now you know. So yeah, it's important to know when to use which. So now if we read this question, in a population that is at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the frequency of a dominant allele is 60%. Now, where would we put that number in? Oh, uh, the P. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the P. Yep. So that would make, so this can be, so what we can do is we can make it, because the thing is that this, equal being equal to one means that we're not doing like a, a percent thing like so the 60 percent like the one is supposed to represent like the hundred part but without the hundred part so it's just one so that means the 60 percent we're gonna have to turn into just 0. 0.6 and what about the q here what do you think that would be uh 0. 0.4 good there you go. So now we have the allele frequencies in the population. So now they're asking, what is the expected frequency? Oh, it's just that. Oh, wait, okay. Hold on. Oh, JK. Uh, of the homozygous recessive phenotype. So what would that be uh, equal to? Uh, like from down here, the choices. Oh, like, oh what the 60% equal to? Or the... Uh, so they're asking for the, for the homozygous recessive genotype. Uh huh. Oh, so they're asking for uh the the Q scare the the Q's the Q. Uh, which one? Uh oh, you're saying like uh, or Q versus Q squared. Uh oh, I, it would it would be the Q squared, right? Tell me why. Um, because this is this is not like a, uh, this is like a single like, and this is like a cross like a homozygous. Uh, maybe I'm not saying because it's saying uh, homo. So, homo oh yeah. So okay, that's true. What if we didn't have that? The recessive genotype. Then I would. Then I would go towards this one. So, what's the difference between that stuff and then the stuff to the right of that? Um. This is like oh, so this is like a like mom and dad crossing, and this is just. So, no, or, what is it? What's the word? Um, it's a uh, di no uh, no a hybrid cross. So I was about to die hybrid cross. What's a hybrid cross? Sorry. Uh well so 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 uh so hold on so so what words can you use to describe like big A big A big A little A little A little A? Um. So this is a. Uh, um homo homozygous dominant this is but like uh if you had to put them all into a category of like what word would you use um inherited no no oh, oh uh would it be phenotype maybe or close phenotype or oh okay then genotype or no Oh, okay. Okay. Genotype. Okay. Yeah. Because this P plus Q equation is just looking at how many people in the population have a, like, a certain allele, like either big A or little a. But since we are diploid, we can't just have one A or one little a, right? So we need to have two. So that's why when you do P squared, you get big A, big A, which now is a genotype, right? Meaning someone can literally have that in their genes. Same thing with the Q squared and the 2PQ. These are all genotypes. So, you know, like I always want to give you multiple ways of answering questions. So for instance, you know, 
you are correct in that the word homozygous, right, indicates that we are talking about a genotype because a genotype must have, like, will have two alleles, right? So if it wasn't that, if it was, you know, like a single thing like these on the left, it, it would be impossible for it to be homozygous or heterozygous or anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. So good. So you were understand, you understood that from the word homozygous. Now, but then I cross that out to say, okay, if we didn't have that word, can you still figure out, like, if it's a gene, it, well, if we're going to use, you know, Q squared or not? Uh, and yeah, you would because they use the word genotype. Now, I always say MCAT, you know, the language is very subtle, but you could see that 32% chose 0.4. And a lot of times it can help to think, okay, why would they choose that? Because it's not like they're stupid or anything. But it means that, you know, this question is written in a in a way that, you know, is very subtle. So why do you think 32% shows 0.4? Uh, because it's uh, uh equal to one, like 0.6 plus 0.4 is equal to one. Uh so basically, so you're saying Q is equal to 0.4. Yeah, Q is equal to 0.4, yes. So so when someone sees this. they miss the word homozygous and the, they miss the word genotype. And also they probably don't know is in bio. It's like, they never teach you like anything really. They're just like, this is the formula. And then this is another formula and then go for it. So a lot of people have confusion about which formula to use. And that explains why a 32, you know, a third of the people here chose 0.4 because they thought, that they were using this formula. But since they're talking about genotype, we use this one. Got it. Yeah. And also something that, so the thing is like a Punnett square, we typically draw like this, right? Mm -hmm. In actuality, like if we're talking about the Punnett square in terms of like the number, you know, frequency of a genotype, the larger, so like the larger P or P squared is means that the Q squared must be smaller, right? So this really looks like something like this, where this is like the A, big A, big A, this is the big A, little A, Big A, little A, little A, little A, which means that the big A, big A is just the P squared. The big A, little A is just PQ. Same thing here, PQ. And then this one is Q squared. So that's how it would look like in actuality. Got it. Yeah, that's a good way if you're short on time to, uh, I like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so here is a little, gra uh, little graph here. I'm trying to find one that isn't like transparent as a background, but I could just, um, take a look at this in the chart. I mean, in the chat. Yeah, so we see here that the red represents the P squared, which is big A, big A, and the blue represents the Q squared, which is uh, little a, little a. And you can see as the amount of big A, big A, or P squared increases, the amount of Q squared decreases. And then when they're both equal, that's when the 2PQ value is the highest.
Ah, ok. So that's the, the thing. So basically, separate the question the p plus q equals one is for the uh just the general frequency of an allele in a population but the p squared plus 2pq plus q squared is the actual genotypes where you know p squared is the big a big a etc so that should help you navigate you know these types of questions okay so okay. I think what you chose was maybe you tried to do 0. 0.6 squared. Yeah. 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 That's what I ended up doing. So. Okay. Yep. Uh, um. I need to, um, one thing I need to start doing is just looking at these metabolic pathways like every day. I feel like that's just easy points. And Yeah, it's, it's, you can get kind of annoying because they could ask you like literally anything. Um, but, uh, and uh, this question is also a bit tricky because like, well, okay, let's talk about this. So tell me what you know about the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Um, it's been a while. Um, I, I yeah, it's like, somehow it feeds into uh, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis. There's some intermediate pathways. It's uh -huh. to generate. So, maybe yeah, this is something that happens once pyruvate enters into the mitochondria during the Krebs cycle. Right. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, maybe I, I. It's 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 really kind of something to like generate NADPH or something like that. Or so it's, it's at the. So it's the thing that turns the pyruvate into um acetyl CoA. Oh. Uh. Oh. What is? Oh. What's the, the the enzyme? Yeah. I think it's part pyruvate carboxylase. Or maybe that's. No. Is that. So that part could be a bit confusing um, because you will have carbon dioxide leave as a uh, product, which could lead people to think that it's a decarboxylase. I know, you know, I even thought that when I saw it, but there's a another uh, reason for that. So ultimately, you get your pyruvate turns into the acetyl CoA, and you have CO two come out as a product and you can oops I'm gonna get you picture here.
Okay, I'm just gonna use. It's weird because, like, even I mean, like, the first thing that comes up when I search it is wrong because it says that there is a decarboxylase. So, hmm. that's. Um, I, I'm trying to find uh, it. as you're looking that up, is it like this? The miles down should be sufficient for my daily kind of. Oh yeah, let's look. Of all... Oh okay, okay. Let's look at pyruvate de uh, if they have it pyruvate dehydrogen complex. Oh, oh, did not, oh, sorry. Here the. So, oh yeah, here it is. Yeah. Yeah, but I was wondering if they had some more information. Can we go down a little bit? Or, oh. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, up or down? Or, sorry. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. I can try that. So maybe. This overview. Um, Here, uh, let's use this. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. There we go. So, you have rather open what I sent here. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here we see the pyruvate over here, starting product. And this is the first enzyme here, which is the pyruvate, which is pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay. And what type of enzyme is a dehydrogenase? Um, <clears throat> dehydrogenase, so without the water, so um it's releasing water so, no. oh. so this one isn't isn't as uh oh intuitive or yeah yeah, yeah. okay uh, but it just means that uh so it's a type of oxidoreductase okay which means that it carries out redox okay now the thing that, you know, like when I looked up pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, like all of these sources were saying that it's a decarboxylase that causes the carbon dioxide to leave. And I used to think that too, until I figured out that it's not that, but um, I don't know if we went over this before, but uh, the generalized like biochem redox pathway like you know if you have like an alkane and you oxidize that it turns into an alkene if you oxidize that it turns into an alcohol did we go over that oh no not yet okay um so do you have like my google drive open um i can pull it up here Let's see. All right, yep, go to PDFs, and it'll be on the top, Biochem, oh, well, bio, it'll be called Biochem Redox, so. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Uh, so, just reverse alphabetical order, so you can just kind of go scroll down, or you can uh, hit. There okay. we go. Yep. There's two of them? Oh, the same thing? Okay, I see. So this is going to be super helpful for you because you're going to be able to uh, apply this to any any type of molecule. So when you're talking about, so okay, in Gen Chem, we learned that oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons, right? Mm -hmm. That's useful in Gen Chem, not useful in Biochem because we're not, we, we can't really see what's happening to electrons here. So this is what's useful in like biochem. It's so oxidation is going to be three things, either the removal of a hydrogen, the addition of an oxygen, or an addition to uh, addition of a bond to oxygen. Okay. 
So let's say we start off here with an alkane, CH2, CH2. And going from left to right, we're oxidizing. So if we oxidize this, we get rid of the these two hydrogens and we put in a double bond to get this over here. And you see how there's just one hydrogen for each and a double mm -hmm. bond. So that's us removing hydrogens. Now, what if we oxidize that further? You'll get the addition of oxygen, aka as an alcohol. So what type of alcohol is this? Like a tertiary alcohol? Yes, exactly. Or... Good. So if you have a tertiary alcohol, you cannot oxidize that any further. Now, if you have a secondary alcohol and you oxidize that, you'll get, what's this? Is that, is that an ester? No, is, or is that? Uh, ketone, no. It's a ketone. Oh, a ketone, okay. Yep. But once you get the ketone, you cannot oxidize that any further. And then lastly, primary alcohol. If you oxidize that, you get, what's this? Uh, aldehyde. Good. And if you oxidize that, you get this, which is what? Uh, carboxylic acid. Yep. So you see how, so from the, so from here to here, we removed hydrogens. From here to here, we added oxygens. From here to here, we added bonds to oxygen. And from here to here, we're adding oxygen again. Now we have two oxygens, right? Uh, what did you say this was? Uh, carboxylic acid. Good, good, good. So, okay, now we have two oxygens. So what's next? Adding bonds another bond to the oxygen, and then you get this. What's this? Uh, oh, carbon dioxide? Correct. Okay. Good. Now, this, so now there's going to be reducing and oxidizing agents of different strength. So, for instance, PCC can oxidize the primary alcohol into the aldehyde, but can't do anything further. Whereas a stronger one, like KMNO4, can oxidize the alcohol all the way to the carboxylic acid. And I didn't write this, but in the other way around, like reducing like this to this, or you know this to this, also matters. So for instance, um, a weak reducing agent can reduce the aldehyde back into the uh, primary alcohol. Um, and an example of that is uh, NaBH4. But that can't, that can't uh, reduce carboxylic acids, and it can't reduce any of the carboxylic acid derivatives either. So for that, if you want to do that, you would need something like lithium aluminum hydride which is a strong uh, uh, reducing agent. So, so here we can apply this to everything that we see in biochem and especially metabolism, so it can make sense to us. So if we go back to that question, I think, um, yeah. Oh, and that picture with the- Oh, the yeah. Med. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. No one. Oh, I think, oh, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. So that. So we know that this is a pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is what type of enzyme again? Uh, you were saying oxoreductase. Yep. So now, could you give me maybe an explanation of why we get a CO two here? CO2 is released, right? Um, um, why are we getting the CO2? It's a good question. So think about the thing that we just looked at. Uh-huh. And we ended up with CO2 somewhere. Uh-huh. Oh, okay, okay. So I'm thinking if it's oxoreduct oxoreductase, there's maybe an oxidation and a reduction happening. And sure, sure. 
Okay. Maybe the CO2 is getting uh, oxidized. Uh, but it, it looks like it's almost coming from... So... Coming from yeah. here? Okay. So you, you take a look at that biochem redox thing again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have your carboxylic acid yep. going to your CO2. Um that's okay. through oxidation, right? I say again, what's that? That's through right. oxidation, right? Yeah, through oxidation. So now tell me how we got that CO2. CO2. This is a okay. acid, right? Oh yeah, it is it is a carbon cell acid. Yeah, because it can it's R wait. Where's the, oh I just not I'm just am I just not seeing the 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 OH or the a, well you know it's an acid it's H is oh. get donated uh -huh. right like yeah there would normally be an H here but it get you know it's gonna be one that gets donated because it's an acid to give you the negative charge oh okay so so oh wait so part so pyruvate is a carboxyl acid. Oh yeah, it's a it's a um I forgot the name. It was like an alpha keto. I'm just so used to seeing it as the the R C O O H. So I guess I guess I didn't. I didn't. Okay, I didn't really. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I think it's like an alpha. Keto glutarate or something like that. But um, but yeah, even if you know you don't remember. Oh, it's a alpha, it's a yeah, I guess it's it can be called um uh a keto acid. Alpha keto acid, yeah, that's what it is. Because you have the part. Yep. And then the acid part. But uh but yeah, so so you can see how people might think that if you're because generally speaking, when you have CO2 as a product, um that's a decarboxylation. However, here it's an oxidation that produces the CO2. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm. where we have pyruvate dehydrogenase, which does that oxidation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's how you get that CO2. And then we have some other stuff like uh, a transacetylase. What do you think that is? Transacetylase. Yeah. Like enzyme class wise. Uh, I'm thinking transferase, but yep. that's my best guess. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you essentially have the. So okay. This uh. Over here is what you get after this first step. Um. But yeah, then this next step here will just kind of tack on this acetyl part. Um. But you can also have this dihydrolipoil dehydrogenase, which is a oxidoreductase. And so we have this turning into this. And you can see how this we can oxidize by getting rid of the H's to make a disulfide bond like that. So that's why it's a dehydrogenase. So basically, just I would remember these three like you know pyruvate dehydrogenase is the first thing um followed by dihydrolipoil transacetylase um and oh it's a transacetylase because we're moving the acetyl or transferring the acetyl to the you know to this over here to a coa which is here and then the the other dehydrogenase so yep that's the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And the, and the purpose is what to de generate uh, 
what is like the big the bigger like purpose of this? Just NADH or something or oh so always oh, okay acetyl or acetylcholate to go into the yeah so in one of my PDFs uh about metabolism um I talk about how oh yeah it's the brain dump one I think oh uh sorry it'll still be called met like metabolism it'll just say brain dump after yeah. So here you zoom in some. Uh, uh, On the bottom, there's a plus sign. You can just use that. Okay. Uh, oh, my bad. Sorry. On the bottom, but I think your taskbar is blocking it. Ah, uh, uh, there. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, so proteins break into amino acids and then get deaminated into alpha keto acids which can then enter into the TCA the uh turn into pyruvate um or turn into acetyl CoA carbs break into glucose which breaks into pyruvate which turns into acetyl CoA fats break down into glycerol and fatty acids the glycerol can break down into pyruvate and turn into acetyl CoA the fatty acids, when you do your beta oxidation, you end up getting acetyl-CoA. So I wrote here, all converge to acetyl-CoA. And all the waste products are ammonia, CO2, or water. So to answer your question, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex takes pyruvate, turns it into... Uh, Acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is like that molecule that the catabolism of all these other types of, let's say, foods uh, come to, like, end up turning into. Because the acetyl-CoA is, gets metabolized in the citric acid cycle, right, which then feels the electron transport chain and all of that stuff. So all of these things, like we 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 usually think of uh, the citric acid cycle as just something from the breakdown of, of glucose, but it's going to handle the break, breaking down of everything. Like, because the protein can turn into acetyl-CoA, the pyruvate we already know has to turn into the acetyl-CoA, and the fats can also turn into the cell coa So that's why that's ultimately what will happen, yeah. So the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, what it does is it um, turns it into a cell coa which can then be broken down for energy by the Krebs cycle. Got it. Okay. Yep. Thirty-seven percent shows. Oh wait, JK, that's the right one. But so we got our. Uh, so okay. So we got our dihydrolipoil transacetylase. We have the the similar type of thing, but dehydrogenase and. We also have the other um, dehydrogenase, mm -hmm. and that pretty much covers that. Got it. Got it. <clears throat> um... So maybe you can help to think, okay, pyruvate dehydrogenase, because pyruvate that's the first thing that pyruvate enters into. And then you have the that the weird word of like lipoil, dihydrolipoil, that's going to show up twice. It's going to first be the acet transacetylase. Yeah, so if you want to like to help you remember is like, okay, what's the first? So there's three of them, three enzymes, right? The first one is the one that takes in pyruvate. So that one that enzyme should have the word pyruvate in it. And since it's oxidizing it, it should also be a dehydrogenase. So that's 
E1. And then E2 and E3 should both start with dihydrolipoil. It's just that E2 is just that transacetylase. And E3 is the dehydrogenase. Okay. And that you ultimately get, uh, end up with the acetyl CoA. Yep. Okay. Um, ah, which, which is true regarding regulation of fatty acid synthesis. Um, so is it okay? So, so if you're making okay, so if you're making glucagon. You want to increase production of sugar, right? So is that why glucagon would be an inhibitor, essentially? Or so you're saying uh tell me what you're saying again. Um, which is true regarding the regulation of fatty acid synthesis. Um I I need to review that. I mm, yeah, yeah. Kind of understand that, but um, I kind of guessed your initial insulin, but I'm assuming it's it, 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 glucagon would would inhibit this process because, um, because I'm I'm a, from the the very little I know, I remember fat, fatty acid breakdown, mm -hmm. so you can like harvest energy, but if you have glucagon, then you're trying to you don't have any energy, right? So you're trying to stimulate like a sugar increase. So is that why glucagon is inhibiting this? Uh, okay. Yeah, so let's see. The rate limiting enzyme um Oh, I didn't. I didn't see the not. Yeah, the the acetyl CoA carboxylase should be the uh, rate limiting enzyme because it's the thing that carboxyl uh, carboxylates the uh, acetyl CoA, um, which is involved in the fatty acid synthesis. Um, and Let's see, the carboxylase is stimulated by epinephrine, or it's inhibited by insulin, or it's inhibited by glucagon. Um, okay. Uh let's see. What tell me your what, what uh so you were thinking tell me what you're thinking again about the insulin and, and glucagon thing? Um yes, uh, uh glucagon uh, I'm assuming would be like uh you need to make sugar so um mm -hmm. and so if you need to make sugar then you're gonna you're gonna inhibit well so <laughs> so i mean based off the answer now i mean it seems like insulin would stimulate because you need to take that sugar and put it into the cells Right, because you're energy rich, but glucagon would mean that you're energy poor. Like, like sh sugar, you need to make sugar. Yeah, and... when you say that, let's specify where. So, like in the bot in the tissue and the cells of our body, like that's where. Um, so, like, if we have a lot of glucose in our bloodstream, we. Uh, have insulin which basically says hey we have all this extra blood sugar let's store it and it can store it in, in the form of glycogen it can store it as fat right now glucagon is the opposite glucagon is if you have low blood glucose and you know you need to make uh 
blood glucose. And you can do that by breaking down, you know, catabolic things. So like breaking down a fat, breaking down glycogen, things like that. So glucagon, so insulin supports or stimulates anabolic and anabolism, the making of things, whereas glucagon stimulates the uh, breakdown, the catabolism of things. Right. Okay. If they're telling us that, uh, well, I guess we don't know, like, spit, like we may not remember that fatty acid synthesis involves acetyl CoA carboxylase, but since all of the choices s include that, we can at least say, uh, you know, we could at least think that it can either be something that. Well, if it's fatty acid synthesis, that likely it's going to be something that, you know, um, causes anabolism, anabolic uh, type of thing. Um, or, wait a sec, hold on. Oh, the inhibit part. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so, okay. Insulin supports... anabolic glucagon supports catabolic but acetyl coa if that's involved in fatty acid synthesis and fatty acid synthesis is anabolic then glucagon which is catabolic would do something to turn off that fatty acid synthesis and so if acetyl coa carboxylase is involved in making fatty acids Glucagon would like to inhibit it because glucagon wants to break things down rather than build things up. Okay. 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 Yeah, I'm used to seeing fatty acid breakdown or something like that. So fatty acid synthesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, I think. Uh, one, one sixty one, and I need to also review my lab techniques, but um. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So this is a good high yield topic. So let's start off with, let's just say this. Let's say that I have Okay. So what I drew here is maybe I should do this too. Okay. So, you know, I might as well just, well, okay. So let's just say that Subunit A is 100, whatever, Daltons, kilodaltons. Um, subunit B is 50. And A, the A's are connected by a disulfide bond. The A and B are connected by, you know, intermolecular forces. And these are proteins. Um, in our native gel, what should we see? Uh, we should see the uh, B traveling farther. So in a native gel, we don't do anything to the protein to break it down or anything. We keep it the way it is. Oh, in its native form. Okay. Okay. Right. So what would we see here? Um, you would see like a, if I recall correctly, you would see like a, like a thicker band kind of that. A and a thinner band at B. Well, we're not um, separating these, right? Mm -hmm. The native gel. 
Oh, okay. So it'd be like one band where you're maybe uh -huh. thicker. Yeah. Like, a th like just one band then thicker at, uh, the A portion and then a little bit thinner at B maybe. So, Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna go back. Okay, I'm gonna do. Okay, so for the native gel, you do not do anything to the protein. So what you should get is a single band that totals 250. Because each A subunit weighs 100 and the B. weighs 50. So that's 100 plus 100 plus 50, right? And so how, how come you doubled A? Oh, because you, you put, okay, I see, I, okay, I see now. Okay. The entire no. thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, next we will have SDS, which is just denaturing, which means that we are, so first of all, do you know like the primary, secondary, tertiary structures of proteins, like how that is yeah more or less like the like when once you get into like um beta then it gets folded and and then like 3d structure and so so uh so i'll give you a quick overview um so primary structure is when you have amino acids that bind mm -hmm. to each other to form through dehydration synthesis and they form a peptide bond and that's a covalent bond um And typically we draw covalent bonds as lines rather than like kind of this thing that I drew over here. Uh, like if you think about a hydrogen bond, you know, it's not like if I had a water here, whoops, mm -hmm. and, and a water here, I would draw the hydrogen bond like this, right? Yeah. Because I if I drew it as a line, that would... imply oh, okay. bond right so, okay. okay now so peptide bond creates that primary structure now in uh you know in, in amino acids and peptides and stuff there's amine groups there's uh carbonyl oxygen groups as well so you can have hydrogen bonding between the backbone the peptide backbone to give you your secondary structure. Now that's prime, that's a hydrogen bonding of the backbone only, not of the subgroup, the uh, side chains. So that gives you your secondary structure. Your tertiary structure is caused by a lot of things. It's caused by this time hydrogen bonding between the, the, the side chains rather than just the backbone. Also electrostatic interactions, Also, disulfide bonds, which are covalent. I drew one here. Connecting the two A's. <clears throat> I drew a disulfide bond there, and it's a line, so it's a real covalent bond. Uh, but the tertiary structure is predominantly uh, dependent on hydrophobic interactions meaning you know if it has like if i let's say like my fingers are hydrophobic 
and you know both of my hands together is like a protein and the cell is mostly water right everything's mostly water so the hydrophobic parts don't like to be exposed to water and that's actually something called an entropic penalty right so what happens to reduce that is to change the conformation so that they can become something maybe like this where it folds to make it so that my hydrophobic fingers are sequestered away from the water around it Possible to buy a layer kind of thing, or oh no no the so oh, okay. th this is still just like a protein Okay. Okay. right so but that just goes to show that this thing happens spontaneously um so uh that's tertiary structure quaternary structure same thing it's just if you have more than one subunit right so okay now there's only so all of the intramolecular forces uh can be broken with denaturing or sds page so for sds here you we would break this bond here because this is an intramolecular bond and not a covalent one like the sulfur is the disulfide so since we've now broken so you're, you're breaking a peptide bond is that what you're doing oh no no no, no. oh okay 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 so peptide and peptide bond and uh disulfide bond they're both covalent bonds which means that they're really strong right Like imagine, so like we talked about between water molecules mm -hmm. as the intramolecular bonds, but within the water molecule, intramolecular is the covalent bond. And we can break this if we boil water. We can't break that though. We can't really separate the oxygen from what, like from the hydrogen. I mean, technically you can in the electrolysis, but that's beyond the scope of this. Uh, but yeah, so think about it like that, like, you know, Is it, is it, but is this a hydrogen bond? I, I'm, I'm, or no, this, this is a, this is not a hydrogen bond, is it, or is it? Nope. It's a covalent bond. So Hold on. Okay. bonds would be like a line that's drawn, uh, rather than like a dash kind of thing. Okay. Okay. Cause like, so like water is held together with. hydrogen bonds, but you can still break the hydrogen bonds by boiling it. Okay. But can you break the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen of the one molecule? No. Correct. Like that is not, because it, it, it covalent bond is just a legit bond. Like it's super, super strong um especially the peptide bond because that also has double bond character so you'll pretty much never see that broken in any of this type of gel uh the only way to break that would be like through a protease or something okay so okay so sds we get rid of the intramolecular bonds between a and b and we're left with this is still intact Plus this, which is separate, right? Mm -hmm. So now we should see what? Uh, now we'll see two bands. Okay. And tell me where we could be. Um, uh, so it would be um, 200 and then... And then 50. Perfect. So 200 and then 50. Good. All right. Now, reducing gel. Now, we are breaking this also. So that means that we just have two A's and one B, right? Mm -hmm. So what can we see for this gel?
Um, so then we'll see. Um, now we'll see th th three bands, right? So, like the two A's separating and the B, or so. Gen or oh no, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. yeah, so generally speaking, like, you know what? If I did this, let's say I called A C. Let's say that that's just C, and C is also 100, and, you know, this is C2, and, you know, this is C here, or rather, 1A, 1C, 1B. So now you would get, oh, crap. So, okay, if I made this number, let's just say, I don't know, like 75 or something, Well, what I'm trying to show is just that, like, if C is different, like, if each three of these are different weights, then, yes, we would see three bands. We would see, like, one at 100 for A, uh, one at 75 for C, one at 50 for B, right? Would it be three lanes also, or or just like one band, like One lane, like, one lane, oh, okay, 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 band at one hundred, a band at seventy five, a band at fifty, okay. Right now, uh, the thing is that this is much more intuitive. But my initial example had two A's, and that would I'll use green, simply give us it'll still give us the B at fifty. But it'll give us only one band at 100 rather than two. Because at 100 is both of the A's. So that's something that can be a little tricky. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. Now, this question says protein X is a hexamer means six subunits, right? Composed of three GP1-GP2 disulfide-linked heterodimers. Okay. Now, what I wrote here, or like, you know, if it's A bound to A, this is a dimer that's a homodimer because they're the same. But if it's like A bound to C, It's still a dimer, but now it's a heterodimer because they're different. And I'll clear this to give myself some space. So let's write out what they're describing. So they're saying that there's three, so there's GP1. I'm guessing GP1 is disulfide linked to GP2. And we have three of these, right? <laughs> yeah. And um let's see. Protein X would produce how many bands on SDS page after treatment with BME? So that uh BME is just beta mercapto ethanol, which uh is something that So sometimes they won't directly say reducing to me because usually reducing means you break the disulfide bonds, but here beta mercapto ethanol breaks disulfide bonds. Okay. So if we added that, we're breaking that, right? Uh -huh. That's okay. the disulfide bond. So now we separated those. So now we should have three at G like three GP1s. And three GP twos, right? What what is what does hexamer mean again? Sorry. So, the prefix is like the number. Mm -hmm. So six. Yep, and the mer is just like, so it's like a monomer, a polymer, okay. right? Like, you know, the number uh -huh. something. Yeah. Uh.
But yeah, now we just have three GP1s and three GP2s, right? And we know that GP1 is not the same as GP2 because they said it's a hetero dimer. So we should see then two bands, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The is is the hexmers relevant? Like, was that uh, that that part was tripping me up? The hexamer composed of three. Is that because three times two is six? So there's three. There, there's two in GP one and two in GP two. Yeah, no. Guys, what's that? Oh, sorry. Oh, just three of those. Uh huh. Right. So I mean, it could be like, so like. GP1 disulfide linked to GP2. And then this could be linked to another GP1 disulfide linked GP2, which could be connected that way. You know, something like this. Oh, okay. So that, that this is a hexama right here then? Yeah. Okay, okay, got it. Got it. Okay. Yep. So you could see that almost half chose C uh chose three. And that's because they likely see that if we have three of these disulfide linked things and you use BME to break the disulfide links, maybe they thought that that's what the three meant, but, but yeah. So if you didn't have BME, what would the answer be? Ooh, so then it should just be like, uh, that's a good question that, actually was thinking about asking you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, so wait, so if we did not have BME, are we, do we have SDS page or no? Uh, I would say yes, because it, uh, unless, so, it's, unless it says reducing, like you said, right? Reducing so, or, B, or, or BME. So uh, yeah, so SDS is just denaturing. So from the question stem, they didn't really tell us what type of bonds exist like in the hexamer. Like we know that the bonds that exist between GP1 and GP2 is disulfide, but you know, between the GP1s could be some type of intermolecular and between the GP2s intermolecular forces. Right. So I'll give you for each. So native would give you uh one band because it's the entire thing right so let's put that there then sds means that we're going to break apart these intermolecular bonds but we are not going to break apart the disulfide bonds right mm -hmm. okay now how many bands should we see four so oh. it might seem like that, but remember that GP1 is the same thing as the other GP1s. GP2 is the same thing as the other GP2s. And also oh. this is identical to this and this. So you really just get one band. Oh, okay. Okay. Right? So, you know, because we have three of these right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like th this one will go up to this point at whatever weight it is. And then this one will go to the same point, same point there. All right. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. So if we had the same thing here, except instead of a GP1 here, it's, uh, sorry, instead of a GP2, it's a GP1. And it's now a, uh, disulfide linked homo dimer how many bands should we see disulfide linked homo dimer um and you you you're, you're doing what you're doing scs page with bme or yeah so we're breaking disulfide bonds um it's I feel like you would still see just one band one band right because we only have GP ones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. 
yeah, see here in the explanation, SDS will separate the three trimers from, from one another. And that's what I did. I mean, it's kind of sloppy here now, but you see like what I did over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can write it again. So GP1, GP1, GP1. They're connected. So GP1s are connected to one another by some type of intramolecular bond. But GP1 is connected to GP2 through covalent disulfide bond. And so, you know, if you just imagine this. If we just, oh yeah, then these are connected this way. So yeah, if you just had SDS, you would break these and you would get three of the GP1s double uh, disulfide linked to G GP2. That's if it's just uh, SDS. So that's what it means by separating the three trimers from one another, forming three separate peptides, right? This is one peptide, another, another, right? But then the BME breaks the disulfide bond between each heterodimer and heterodimers are different sizes because that's exactly what it means. Hetero means different. In this case, different sizes. That's what gives you however many bands. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, I think those those are all the questions I had for BB. Um, yep. I, yeah, I only have three. I only I I have I, through, for for CP. I only, I've only gotten through um, three questions. I don't know. If we save that for later or. Uh, I don't know. What uh, what questions? Like, if I take a look, maybe it, you know I can see if I can get it answer them in these last couple of minutes. Okay. Um. So uh. Okay. Seven. So you know I I just I understand the the trend the um. Where is it now? I can well I can I don't have it up here right now, but I understand generally like that the trends. So um. Yeah. Oh, so the thing is with this is that they're asking for the second ionization energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As so, opposed to the first, right? Yeah. So if you open up your periodic table. So yeah, you you know the trend up and to the right for ionization, ionization energy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but now we're looking at second. So for instance, let's say... Let's say we have lithium. Everything wants to either gain electrons to fill its octet or lose electrons to fill its octet. Um, and for helium, of course, there's no octet because a complete shell for helium or, you know, 1s1, I mean, sorry, 1s2, there's no 1p, right? So helium is an exception that can fulfill its octet without being an octet. But yeah, you have to ask yourself, uh, what can it everything everything just wants to be like a noble gas so lithium can lose an electron to turn into helium and it really wants to stay as helium it doesn't want to lose an, another electron because it's really happy being helium so that's going to be something that has uh, a low first ionization energy, but relatively speaking, a higher second ionization energy. Okay, because it doesn't want to have it doesn't want to have its second electron removed. Um, compare that to, or if you can move this a little, I, I want to see what the oh, sorry. Yeah. are. Yeah, you can hit close. Oh, oh, it's close or okay. Yeah. Okay. Lithium, beryllium, sodium, magnesium. Okay, you can bring it up again. All right, so 
let's say that we have beryllium, right? So same thing, it wants to be like a noble gas. So it can lose its first electron to be like the lithium. And that's the first ionization energy, right? When you're saying it's losing its first electron? Correct. Okay. So, yep, that's the first ionization energy. And it want it's not, you know, it wants to, to lose another one to be like helium. So this is going to have a low second ionization energy because it wants to lose two electrons. It wants to get ionized twice, right? And so uh, sodium here, right, wants to lose an electron to be like neon. And so sodium will have a low first ionization energy. But once it's at neon, it wants to stay at neon. So it's not going to want to give away another electron to be like fluorine, right? So sodium will have a higher second ionization energy compared to its first. So we can kind of look at it that way too. So like sodium, whoops, um, second ionization energy should be greater than first ionization energy. Um, if we look at magnesium here, first ionization energy would make it like sodium. Second would make it like neon. So magnesium has a low second ionization energy, but if you want it to ionize it again, it doesn't want to do that. So yeah, so that won't work. Beryllium, oh yeah, I think I went over that. So so yeah, we're essentially looking for, um, in order for something to have the same electron configuration as a noble gas, um, And that could involve losing electrons. Um, it'll do whatever it can to lose electrons uh, to be like the noble gas. But once it's in, it's reached its objective of being the noble gas, it's not going to want to change from there. So it'll be easy for it to turn into the noble gas, aka low ionization energy. But once it's the noble gas, it's not easy for it to lose any more. So that becomes the second ionization energy. So the, so the higher the ionization energy, mm -hmm. does that mean it's 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 harder to remove that electron, or is it the I get reversed? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you can okay. even think of it like this: like, okay, let's say that you are. Let's say, I don't know, let's say sodium comes up to you and is like, hey, I want to be like, or you're like, hey, sodium, how much does it cost for me to have an electron? And sodium says like, I don't know, 20 bucks. um, And then turns into the neon. And then you ask him when he's neon, hey, how much for an electron? He'd be like 5 million. Because he doesn't want to give up that second electron because he's happy as neon. Right? Got it. So, so for, mm -hmm. uh, so it, 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 for for sodium to go to neon as opposed to neon to go to fluorine, that's never going to happen. So, well, the the ionization energy comparison is higher for neon to go to fluorine because it doesn't want to give it up. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay, and uh, ionization energy is essentially. Oxidations. Oh no! Just think about it. Like you know, the amount of energy it takes to ionize something, aka lose an electron, gain an electron, that kind of deal. Okay, ionization. Okay, so it would be reduction or oxidation. Okay, okay. Oh no, no, no. not like uh, not like redox. Okay. Is like oxidation state and stuff like with redox. That's different because with redox you need a pair. Right, you need like something that gets reduced, something that gets oxidized. Ah, okay. And you can't have just one, right? And then okay. you need a pair. Uh, but like the periodic trends like this are 
looking at just the specific atoms themselves. And so if you look at just the atoms itself, you can see that, uh, like, think about it, like, so if you go to space, there's tons and tons of uh, cosmic rays and things from the sun that we call ionizing radiation because it's radiation, aka light, that has so such a high energy that it can strip off the electrons from things, uh, really damaging it. Um, so think about it like this. Think about okay, how much if I'm if I have you know sodium in front of me, how much will he charge to to give me an electron, right? So, you know, for that first electron, it'll be like cheap, but the second electron is not going to be cheap because it's already where it wants to be. But yeah, just think of it as the amount of energy required to to take an electron away. Okay. 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 Yep. Um, okay. And I just I, I get a little bit tripped up between Zeph. And then also, like, I understand the 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 only one that's in reverse is atomic size is going kind of this way. Yeah. So electronic repulsion or something like that. Or so. Oops. So going this way, diagonal, aka up into the right. Mm -hmm. going to be electronegativity, ionization energy, electron affinity. I think those are the ones. And then just the opposite, diagonally going down, aka left and bottom and going down, is atomic radius. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, is that because electrons are increasing, so you're getting more electronic propulsion? Uh, well, if you, since you mentioned the Zeth thing, the... Okay. Uh, a radius of a of an atom is like the nucleus is positively charged and therefore attracted to the electrons that it's surrounded by. So the nucleus tries to pull the electrons towards itself, and that's Zeph, right? Is that is that specifically valence electrons or just all electrons? Or uh, yeah, it'll be like all electrons. Um, but it's more relevant. for valence electrons because that can turn into like so for instance like let's say like you know you're the nucleus and you're the protons and you're pulling the electrons towards yourself um and let's say that there's two electrons that you're that you're pulling uh and let's say the atom loses an electron right and now you have one electron you can then pull that electron closer to you since it's you don't have to be pulling two electrons but just one So it's like if you're doing a workout and you can do a certain amount of reps or something, but if you remove some weights, you could do more, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you had something like this, and this is your nucleus, two electrons, you're dividing like your strength to pull both of these guys, whereas... If you just had one, you can pull it in closer, resulting in a smaller size. And then the opposite would be if you added another electron, like to have three, now you have to divide your strength to pull like across three electrons rather than the two. So you can't pull that in as closely. So that's going to be a larger size. Okay, you can't pull it in that closely, so it's gonna be a larger size. Yeah, because it had because there's that electron shielding, right? But think about it like you know, think about I don't know if this is like two hundred pounds that you're benching or whatever, and then this one is like you take off like I don't know you take off like a plate or something, and it's like whatever a hundred and ten here, and then this one it's like you add another plate or something, and that could be like you know, uh. 290 or something it's like that it's like if you if you are doing a workout and you add weights to it that's like adding electrons
And if you remove weights, it's removing electrons. And it's easier to pull things that have fewer electrons, aka less weight, than the other way around. Right. Got it. Okay. So, oh yeah, so that's relevant in a question, like there's a question that you saw here that was like, that which one has the largest ionic radius? And people usually get that wrong because they, 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 they use a periodic trend, but the periodic trend is for atomic radius, not ion, uh, ionic radius. Ionic radius is when you have an ion, meaning an electron can be added or removed. And if an electron is removed, you can pull it in closer, so it's a smaller size. But if you're adding electrons, you can't pull it in as closely, so it's a larger size. Got it. Is, is that when elect electron repulsion is happening, or? Oh, no, no. It's just, uh, it's a Zeff thing. It's like the positively charged proton wants to pull the negatively charged electrons towards itself. Uh -huh. So it's not, it's an attractive force, but... It just has to be spread apart across la a larger amount of electrons. Okay. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So let me. Okay. So. Here's a image. So atomic radius is, you know, just the experimentally determined distance between two nuclei. Covalent radius is like kind of like half of that, but you don't have to worry about that really. Just uh, the ionic radius, right, is between the ions. I should have sent something that was more so that. Here, here's a better one. Yeah. So we can see here sodium normal atomic radius here. Sodium cation is smaller, right? And we see that for the cations. For cations, the Atomic radius is greater than the ionic radius. However, for anions like chlorine here, once it loses or gains, you know, electrons here, it's significantly larger. So, yep. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm going to have to go to my next. Okay, let me get my phone to... Uh... Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, how much is it there? Uh, one sixty three. Okay.
Got it. Perfect. Awesome. So yeah, I would say to continue reviewing this. Okay. And how's cars going? Um, it's been a little bit stagnant, so I still need I need to get back on. I need to get back more frequently. Sure, sure. Yeah. All right then. So, um, you'll use my Calendly for next time, or yeah. Awesome. So yeah, good luck with uh, all this stuff, and I'll see you sometime next week. All right. Okay, sounds good.